Hello and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. A big thank you to Barclays for supporting this series of The Game Changers, which features fearless women in football and reinforces their incredible support for the beautiful game. My guest today is Mary Harvey, a US goalkeeper who won the World Cup and Olympic gold before an incredible career which included roles with FIFA and US soccer. Mary is now CEO at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. I began by asking Mary where she grew up. I grew up in a little town outside of Palo Alto, which is of course now become where all the venture capital comes from in the Silicon Valley. But back then it was very different. It was very much research, aerospace and defense, Stanford, you know, Slack, different research institutions. So very brainy, you know, part of the world. Um, but it wasn't about the Silicon Valley, but that's where I grew up. Um, actually a little town called Los Altos Hills is where I'm from. And what was it like playing soccer then for a young girl? And when you started at 12, you say the seventies, what was it like playing soccer at the time? It was, I mean, for me, uh, I went to a very small private school and um, there weren't, the class sizes were small and you sort of, every year you moved up with the same kids. So, you know, your social circle wasn't going to be defined by people who were in your class. So for me, it was, I got a chance to meet kids, you know, outside of my school, which was great. And I think it's where I really started to discover that I had real physical literacy. I was good at sports. You know, I, I struggled in other areas. Um, you know, I was very nearsighted, more glasses and some other things, but I was coordinated. I was athletic. I felt better. So I think maybe it was more starting to understand that. And really it was my first opportunity to be in team sports and, and understand that you're part of something that's bigger than you. And being a middle kid, it's a bit of a setup, <laughs> you know, so you're sort of programmed that way to sort of, how's everyone doing? <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, it was wonderful. And was soccer seen as more of a girl sport than a boy sport? That's, I guess that's a perception that we have from the UK. Is that, is that the case? Was that the case when you were growing up? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, it was just a whole different world back then, a whole different world. I mean, we hadn't hosted World Cup 94. I mean, when I started playing, there was no women's international football. FIFA hadn't even figured out that it was going to have a women's World Cup. I mean, there wasn't even a national team. Maybe they were playing like 76 I started playing. I mean, that definitely ages me. Um, but <laughs> on Wikipedia, you can find out how old I am. So <laughs> probably not a shock. You know, so none of this was really anything that we, I mean, we couldn't imagine, you know, what 20 years later would look like. I'd be playing in the Olympics. I mean, football, women's football be in the, in the Olympic. I mean, like none, I mean, it's just, you just never could have imagined it back then. And the, the podcast is a fairly British audience. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about title nine, because not everybody's kind of really aware of that. So a little background would be fantastic. Sure. So, and I'm I'm definitely not the expert. It's fun, funny. I think you may have had Moya Dodd on. I did. I did. Yes. Yeah. So Moya, Moya's a mate, and uh, she and I were in Washington D.C. for some event, and um, we had a day free or half a day free, and she wanted to go to the National Archives of all the places. I said, really, you want to go to Air and Space? No, I want to go to National Archives. Okay, so go to the National Archives, and she wanted to see Title Nine. Ah, yeah. And I remember when we, and it was this one wall where it had, it was dedicated to women and it was the equal rights amendment and it was title nine. It was the same session of Congress that passed both. I mean, it was like the, the 55th Congress of the U S like was bad ass. I mean, they just equal rights amendment title nine. I mean, they, bam, they just got it done. I forget which Congress it is. Nancy Hogshead Makar would definitely know, but um, title nine, is, is basically this, this concept that if there's public funding, that there be equality of opportunity. And that was interpreted in a variety of ways. Um, and it was interpreted when it came to funding of athletics programs. And it was never intended that it would cover that. And yet it did. 
So what it meant was, is that girls became, started to have access to funding for sports programs. And, you know, Nancy, you know, and Donna DeVarona, love Donna DeVarona. If you want to talk about Title IX, you absolutely have to talk to Donna DeVarona. Excellent. I mean, her fingerprints are all over it. I mean, literally, I'm not saying kind of, I mean, literally. And then Nancy picked up the baton after her. And Donna will tell you that she was, I think, uh, talking to the swimmers in the 1984 Olympic team. And she was talking to them. And Nancy Hogshead was in the room. Nancy Hogshead Makar. And she said, you all are about to become famous. The question I want to ask you is, what are you going to do with it? And she looked at the women and she said, I think, I don't want to, John may say I got the story wrong, but she said, what are you going to do with it? She goes, I want it to be about Title IX. Nancy goes on to get a law degree at Georgetown and has dedicated her life, among other things, to defense of Title IX. So Title IX is basically the concept that women, uh, it, it guarantees resourcing for women and women's sports, among other things, but also for educational institutions. And men passed it. A largely male Congress passed it. And it was amazing. It was has been transformative for opportunities that women and girls have in the United States, without question. And did it impact your own experience, do you feel? Uh Yine, yes and no, as they say in German. <laughs> um, no, in the sense that I wasn't a direct recipient of Title IX funds. I actually had an anti-scholarship, um, to uh, which is where I was paying funds. I was right at the very beginning because I'm a little bit older than the Title IX generation, at least for the, my sport. I think in other sports it was implemented earlier. My sport was just getting traction. So during the course of my time at the University of California, Berkeley, which is where I went to university. Got my colors on today. <laughs> During the course of my four years there playing, we saw money come in that then funded um, players, but they, they always funded the younger players because yeah. we wanted to attract them. Right. So yes and no, I benefited for sure. Um, but what's happened afterwards has been extraordinary. So good to hear, isn't it? Did you ever imagine as you were growing up that there was an opportunity or there would be to have a, a career in soccer at all? As a professional football player? Yeah. Absolutely not. I mean, there wasn't anybody. I mean, again, there's no Women's World Cup. There's no Olympic Games. There's no women's national team. The women's national team got established in 1985 in the U.S. Digital you know, accessibility of information wasn't what it is today. Right. It wasn't like I could see the German women's national team playing in 1989 in the European Championships. Actually, I did because I was living in Germany at the time. But prior to that, you wouldn't know that. Right. So, no, um, it wasn't. I mean, you were done playing essentially after college. Yeah. College ended, which was your league that you played in. And at the age of 21, you're done. Now, you know, as a professional player now, you're just starting to find out how good you are when you hit 21. And you did go on to play in, in the national teams. That wasn't an ambition as a as a younger player. And obviously, we could talk for hours about your incredible playing career. So you're in the team that won both the World Cup and a, and a home Olympics too. What would be some of your most powerful memories from your career if you, you had to cite a couple? Um. You know, you get older and you have a chance to digest it through a different lens, right? And you sort of, over time, appreciate more and more what you've learned. I would just say indelible examples of leadership that I saw. I mean, it's the pursuit of performance. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, I talk to teammates now and we're talking to each other as adults. Uh, it's not what we were adults back then, but <laughs> as more mature adults with 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 life behind us, right? 20 years, parenthood, all these things behind us. And we're now looking at our shared experience of what we learned back then through a different lens. And I've had a chat with uh, some teammates, including some who are now also in leadership positions in sport. And we're talking about diversity and inclusion, for example. And if you've come out of an environment where you've been a team sport elite athlete, and you're trying to understand why diversity and inclusion isn't inside sports bodies, 
it literally is baffling because if you're a performance athlete, the only thing that matters in anything when you're choosing people is, is this the best team that's going to drive performance? And it doesn't matter what the team looks like. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter. Literally, can you help the team perform? And if you can, that is what matters. That's the only thing that matters. And so when you're looking at trying to unpick why things like there aren't enough women in senior management positions, there you know, aren't people from different backgrounds in senior positions in sport, and yet there is ample evidence that teams that are diverse for a variety of reasons perform better. That evidence is, is not in dispute. I mean, it's clear. Why would you not want that? Why would you not want to have a team that was performing at such a high level? If you talk to people like me and like, you know, others, it's like, we can't wrap our head around why we would do that. You know, it's so, I think about the things that I got on a daily basis. I mean, there's certainly moments that are incredible from the 91 World Cup to, you know, the Olympic Games, incredible moments. But I'd say the day-to-day things that I got from just interacting with extraordinary human beings. I mean, I, you can't put a price on that. And the U.S. women's soccer team today are renowned for being real trailblazers, especially in the area of equal pay. Has this always been the case for the national team? <laughs> you know, I get asked that question quite a bit. And, and, well, you know, and we were, I mean, I was part of the team back in, you know, I joined the team in 89. And there had been a team that had been in place since 85, but – in the years of like 89, 90, 91, 92, it was the first World Cup. It was, so I don't want to take anything away from those who came before us, but there was definitely, we were kind of laying down the culture, I think at that point of what we were about. And we, there are a variety of things that you could say about what was true then that you can still say is true now even though the team has gone through metamorphosis of, you know, the whole thing has metamorphosized since then, but some things are still true today. And one of them is how do we make it better for those who come after us? Right. I mean, nobody wants to go through what we went through. So how do we make it better? It's a bit like being a a parent, right? How do I make sure that those, the kids that come after us don't have to have the same, they're going to have their own set of issues but not the same issues that we had. They shouldn't be fighting about maternity leave. They shouldn't be fighting about childcare and nannies and things like this. I mean, if you're breastfeeding, it is not an option for, I mean, come on, let's just have a real discussion about this. We would have loved to have had a discussion about equal pay, but I mean, it had to evolve. We had to get maternity leave done. We had to get, you know, basic things dealt with so that the next generation wouldn't have to. And that's what's been consistent, I think, is this idea of what are we leaving for the others to pick up? And obviously this year, the judge threw out the claim for equal pay. Can you see a day soon when this will be achieved? Um, God, I hope so. Um, You know, uh, and it's not, it's, you know, people talk about how you determine what's equal pay. Um, and, and I come back to, if you chronically under, if if you look at it very narrowly and say, well, money that comes in is directly related to X. So therefore Y is appropriate as compensation. If you've chronically underinvested for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, the men have been, you know, invested, there's been investment in the men's game for decades and you're just starting to invest in the women's game, and then you take a snapshot and say, well, based on these numbers, that's what you you should earn. It's not a fair argument if you've been chronically under-investing or over-investing in, in one versus the other. So I think some of the comparisons are not uh, equal. I don't think you can make them. I think a better comparison is if you've had equal investment, and one is earning more than the other, then you can have a discussion perhaps about that. But that's not the case here. Yeah, yeah. And if I look at the makeup of the team right now, it perhaps doesn't look as diverse as it might. Is that fair, do you think? Um, 
will work. In terms of race and ethnicity within the uh, US team and how that relates to the rest of the population. You think there is not sufficient diversity? No, it doesn't, but maybe that's an outsider looking at it as it is at the moment. Do you feel there is? Um, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it can always be more diverse. And I think certainly, I mean, but, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about the player pool, which, which leads into, you know, the national team. Yeah. Um, the, the, the sport in the United States, men and women, which is not the way it is in the rest of the world. It's very much a, a, an upper middle class type sport, which is probably what you're getting at. So yes, and that's that's a known issue. And if you think about it, the United States is a country of people who have chosen to come and live there from dif- from our inception, right? <laughs> We're a former colony and, and uh, people have chosen from different countries to come to the United States and make it their home. So we have all of these backgrounds and from different parts of the world that are in the United States. And also we have do- different socioeconomic, as every country does, uh, levels. And in every other part of the world, football is the game that is accessible to everyone. But in the US, it has become something that is accessible to people who have the money to participate. And that's going to be a natural funnel um, if that is then what leads into your elite elite programs. Um, so is the women's national team or any, or the men's national team or others as diverse as they could be? No, for that very reason, because it's not uh, a reflective of the entire population that probably would want to participate if they could. Moving on, I guess, through your career, you had some uh, big roles in management consultancies, and then you went to work for FIFA in 2003, I believe. What was your, your role there? So I went to work for FIFA in 2003 uh, as its director of development. And at the time, uh, there wasn't, the structure was different. So you had uh, director levels sat directly below the general secretary. So the secretary general, general secretary, what have you, and the general secretary reported into the president. So I was, I reported to the general secretary. So the equivalent of Fatma Samora today. Um, a man named Urs Lindsay. He's the one that hired me. Um, and when I came on board, I uh, was one of very few Americans who had held that position. And I was the first woman. And what are you most proud of from your time in that role as you look back now? That I, I did some things personally that, because you, you're going to win some and you're going to lose a lot of battles. So it's about winning the war. <laughs> You're going to lose the battles, but you want to win the war. And I would say I feel very good about my fingerprints being on some things that mattered. I remember the very first time when we had year-end reviews and I saw what everybody was making and I immediately addressed some gender pay gaps like that. I mean, there were no gender pay gaps in the development division at FIFA <laughs> while I was there, period, full stop. Um, I instituted salary bans and it was, you know, blind to, to things that had nothing to do with anything other than performance and a level of responsibility. Um, so I feel good about that, that I did right away. I put in some things that were dismantled after I left that I felt good about. So I instituted, um, financial transparency into development money that was going out the door to FIFA. Um, so I put in place an independent audit requirement. I put in place a quota for women's football was already in place, but my job was to enforce it. And um, I had zero sense of humor and I could find any number of ways that people would try to use to justify that money was spent on women's football and it wasn't being spent on women's football. So, uh, you know, after years of that, people just said, right, we're just going to pr- put in programming for women's football. Because they knew that to just stop with the games and just do it. Because we, you know, and I would deduct money. I'd just say, you know what, if you don't spend it on women's football, you're getting less next year and you still have the same amount you have to spend on women's football. So just just do it. Just do the right thing. Stop trying to, you know, get around it. It's not going to work. You know, the establishment of the under-17 Women's World Cup, um, I saw an opportunity there and shamelessly 
you know, pandered to their sense of, you know, equality and just said, listen, you're about to expand the men's world cup to 24 teams and you don't have one for the women's world cup, establish it. Funding, you know, development of women's referee, the women's referee program. Um, I mean, those are just the things that have to do with the women's football, but I felt very good about those things. And, and how did your time there impact your views on the, the power of sport to influence wider society, do you think? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, you became, because of the nature of it, I mean, we call it the power of football because just the size and scope of the sport it is global. It's the, if you think about it, besides humanity and perhaps gender, right? So that's 50% of the population. What's the next thing that people have in common? It might be the sport of football, if you think about it, that people share somehow as a fan, as, as a child, as an adult, whatever. Um, it, it's this, this, this thing that is this universal language. And I think it was profound respect for that. And um, also a sense of how I fit into it, both as a woman, as uh, an American, you know, because everybody has their own way of relating to it. But I think those things made the biggest impact. And in, in 2009, you went back to the US to be the COO of the new Women's Professional Soccer League, the WPS. Mm -hmm. What was happening in the women's game at the time in the US when you returned? Well, it had been after uh, the failure of the first league, WUSA, and it had been a number of years. And um, it was a point where there had been a business plan, there had been investors and owners set up, and we had wind at our back, which was you know a business plan that didn't look at a single entity, it looked at an ownership model. It was after a prolonged period of not having a women's league in the U.S., after WSA. So WSA 2003, it was then 2009. Wow. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's a, that's quite a bit of time as opposed to WPS uh, shuttered in 2011 and almost immediately you saw the NWSL show up. Yeah. Yeah. And WPS was important for a lot of reasons. And there were, there are elements of, you know, things about it that were systemic that didn't work. Um, but also it, it was that combined with the great recession that, that hit, like, I mean, I think the, the month we kicked off the Dow Jones industrial average was at 6,500. I mean, it was just, just the worst possible economic and no new deal money was coming in. None, nobody was doing new deals. So it's just hard, but we learned a ton. And I do believe it played a big role in the NWSL. Excellent. That was going to be my next question. That's all good. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Centre for Sport and Human Rights and how you came to take the role that you have now? Sure. So I'm the CEO for the Centre for Sport and Human Rights. And before I took this job, I was running it, my own consultancy called Ripple Effect. And um, the US was once again bidding to host the World Cup, uh, this time with Canada and Mexico. The World Cup would be 48 teams, first time. And uh, the and I wanted in because I mean it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I believed in United as one. I, I fundamentally believed in it. But one thing, and I'll get to how this brought me to the center, was you know I wanted to be on the sustainability team because I've always cared about it, and uh, I bid I wanted to be a part of the uh, the environmental protection team because I you know also that's a big part of. Uh, me and what I believe in is environmental responsibility. And they said, well, we'd love you to do that, but we have someone who can do that. The part that we don't know that nobody knows is this new human rights piece. The human rights is now going to be, there are going to be all these human rights requirements and nobody knows it. And so they asked me to do that. And so they landed on my desk on October 16th, 2017, and nobody knew them. I, and I read them and I didn't understand them. As part of the bid process. This is part of the bid process. This is part of the bid process, right? So I'm in New York and, you know, part of the bid team and these human rights detailed requirements come flying over the internet and they land on my desk and I pick them up and I have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And I remember reaching out to a woman named Minky Warden at Human Rights Watch. And I said, Minky, you know, like, I don't understand this. She goes, you're perfect. Because once you learn it, you're going to explain it to the world of sport who also doesn't understand it because you speak their language and we need somebody who has a foot in both worlds. 
She was absolutely right. So that led me to this powerful experience of what's possible when you have built this bridge between the values of what sport wants to achieve. So all the powerful things that I personally got from sport, it was in the presence of this incredible opportunity, but also bad things didn't happen to me, right? So that's possible, but that's not the case for many, many men and women. I'll never forget being at the you know Council on Foreign Relations in New York and being asked the question, what has sports given me? And I talk about all the things, some of the things I talked to you about. And then afterwards, a woman came up to me who was a little bit emotional and she said, that was beautiful what you said. It really moved me. And then she said, but I'm sad because everything that you just said sport gave you, it took from me. And it, one of these women, uh, she was one of the Larry Nasser survivors. Oh, wow. Right. And I've never forgotten that. And I will never forget that. And that's who we work for at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. So it's this idea that for sport to be what we hold it to be and what it can deliver, it's in the presence of safeguards to ensure that it, that it does that. And that makes sure that when you put on a mega sporting event, that at a minimum, there's no harm being done. And unfortunately, we have examples of where harm has happened. People die building stadiums. That shouldn't be the case. Those are preventable deaths. Journalists are threatened or not able to report freely. Neighborhoods can be bulldozed to make way for infrastructure for for an event. Um, There's pollution. There's all sorts of things that can happen. And what the center does is we say, okay, these are known issues. How can we work with sports bodies to help them understand how they can build protections in to prevent these harms from happening. And there's two sort of ways we do that. One is through what we know about what's happened in the past with mega sporting events, like the World Cup, the Olympics, what have you. Um, the, all the different ways where we've seen things happen in the past. Beyond preventing those, let's talk to the people who have been impacted from those, hear from them directly, affected groups we call them, and say, how can we incorporate their voice into how we do things going forward? Very, very powerful. So part of it is our work is mega sporting events. And the other part of our work is day-to-day sport. And that gets into things like safeguarding. And how do you ensure that, and I just, we just did a webinar this morning on athlete abuse. What have we learned about what happened in Afghanistan? What happened in, what's happening in Haiti? Um, what's happened in Japan to athletes, what's happened in gymnastics. What can we take from that, those horrible examples, and say, what are we learning about what's key to preventing this? And what's key to enabling victims to feel safe enough to report? And so all of these things are part of what we call the work around day-to-day sport and helping sport bodies understand how can we make commitments to human rights and put it in place so that we know that if that ever happens, God forbid, we have an approach to address it that is centered on the victim and what he or she needs, as opposed to protecting the institution, right? That's a paradigm shift that's needed. And those are some of the sorts of things that we do at the center. I mean, we do lots of other things, but at a core, that's those are the big ones. And how long have you been in existence? Um, well, it's been... It was officially launched uh, by our chair, Mary Robinson, the great Mary Robinson, in June of 2018. And so uh, the fall of that year, they spent um, you know, putting together the business plan and launching it, and then uh, recruiting the CEO. So I was selected at the end of 2018, and 2019 I started. So I've been in the saddle since January of 2019. And what, what concerns you most within sport at the moment you talk about those those different areas that you've highlighted but I guess what concerns you most and how do you personally balance that positivity and and negativity that sport brings well uh, I think I think I'm just wired to be an optimist um Mary Robinson and I share that (laughs) um as she said I'm a prisoner of hope and I think um I'm just wired that way I try to just yeah you like that I mean that's hers but I, yeah, I'm. That's just how I choose to to view things. I think that's just something that you you just have. What I think is one of the hardest things that we're dealing with is this sense. I think of we're sports, so we're different. 
We're sport. We're not government and we're not business. We're different. We're sport. And we have this autonomy. And that doesn't work (laughs) when it comes to human rights abuses. It just doesn't. Governments have a duty under the UN guiding principles to protect human rights. They have a duty to protect them. Businesses have a duty to respect human rights. Where does sport land? I mean, it's a bit, I hate to say it because it, it sounds like I'm trying to pick a fight, but I'm not. Kind of sounds like what we've heard for a long time about religion and organized religion in the church, right? Where's the oversight uh, for things uh, when it comes to religion? I think when it comes to sport, um, when it comes to human rights, there are frameworks that can help sport navigate human rights abuses and human rights in general that will be very helpful for them. So what we try to do is make that bridge between, you know, you're part of a bigger community, the UN guiding principles apply to you, and we're trying to help you now navigate um, a world that has a bunch of phrases and concepts and acronyms that we don't understand. But there are ways to take apart how to respect human rights. And um, companies all over the world are doing it as pillar two of the UN guiding principles. So it is possible. But I think that's the biggest challenge is sport sort of wrapping its head around, actually, you know, this is our problem. We can't just say that's not us. That's not our problem. It is our problem. And how has sport responded to the Center for Sport and Human Rights? That's a bit of a broad question, isn't it, is the whole of sport. But how have those major international federations responded to your uh, existence? That's a great question. I think initially fearful. I mean, if I'm just being very candid, sport and human rights sound scary, right? They're going to come after me. They're going to start naming and shaming me in public and I don't want to engage, right? I mean, that's the first. But when they get to know us, they go, huh, that's actually not what I expected. They're trying to help me. They're trying to give me practical, plain spoken advice on how to handle these things. They understand me. I I go walk into a room when I talk to sports bodies and I said, listen, I get it. I've been in your shoes. I've been inside a sports organization. And three years ago, I didn't understand what any of this meant. None of it. I get it. So, but here's the deal. (laughs) It's not going away. We have to understand how to, how to address. So what we're going to do is we're going to help unpack it into pieces that you may already be doing. You may be already doing a lot of this work. You don't realize it's human rights work. And secondly, there's a lot of information on how we can, from other situations, understand how to mitigate some of these risks. I listened to your uh, recent podcast with Minky Warden uh, from Human um, Rights Watch and heard about the, uh, you alluded to earlier, the disturbing findings about the treatment of young athletes in Japan particularly, Does it frustrate you that people aren't aware of what's happening in sport in terms of safeguarding? Or do you think they just kind of choose not to engage and and to look further? Um, There's a little bit of burying your head in the sand, I think, that has been happening. But, I mean, you've seen this. Many things have happened in 2020 that we didn't expect. And one of them is athlete activism and athlete voice. And athletes are speaking out now about a lot of things. And with that has also come um, more and more instances where gymnasts around the world are saying this isn't okay. The sport of ice skating, rugby with a transgendered like rule, you're starting to see more and more cases of where athletes and not just athletes, whistleblowers and others saying, you know, this, this is not okay. And it's happening. It's not just one sport or another sport. It's a lot of different sports. It's not just in certain parts of the world. It's all over the world. And it's it's systemic. And what's eerie, because there's so many similarities between the different cases, different sports, different parts of the world, similar themes. So I guess my question then is, is there, or two questions really, one is in the, using the name of your previous company, but is there a ripple effect in terms of a, a bit of a pivotal time of people calling things out? And why, why has it happened now? Or is it just we're now talking about it and, and airing it now? Well, for several reasons. One is, is um, th- what, what they have in common is regardless of sport and regardless of, of area of the world, 
you're dealing with a situation, particularly with elite athletes, where the power differential is enormous, right? So uh, the more elite the athlete, the more is at stake. That's not to discount how important it is for recreational sport and grassroots sport. But if you're trying to go to the Olympic Games and your key to going there is through somebody who holds basically a lot of your career in the balance, that is a bad recipe uh, for bad things happening. So, and what we're seeing is, is that there's that, the, the, the sort of dynamics that are really ripe for bad things to happen if bad people get into those positions, uh, combined with uh, sports bodies likely don't have a process or the process that they do have is subject to protecting more the institution than the interest of the victim. So this is this whole idea of a victim centered approach. Um, and that we need survivor-centered or victim-centered approaches to make sure that when somebody reports, I mean, lots of things about what happens then need to be fixed. You shouldn't put the burden on the whistleblower to prove what's happening or what's not happening, right? That's not okay. You know, I'm a coach. I think something's happening. Something doesn't look right. Something doesn't feel right. I think this might be going on. Can you look into it? That's where it starts. And then it proceeds to get broken. It's broken in several different ways as it goes from there, right? Who do they give that information to? Is that coach going to get fired, right? So is there an independence of process that, that gives it integrity so that it, it eventually arrives at a place where the whistleblower is protected, the victim's protected, they're not asking to, you know, have to recount what happened to them, for example, in close proximity to somebody who abused them, right? So they feel safe. All these things are, are things that are similar, similar stories across the world of there's a fear of reporting either by the victim or by whistleblowers because the process that lies behind it doesn't protect them. They don't feel safe. That's one of several examples of things that need to change in order for things to start to move in the right direction. And do you feel positive that we're, so it's been a, a horrific year in terms of things that have been discovered and aired, but do you feel it's also a positive move forward that we are talking about these things far more? Talking about it is always going to be important. You know, I was on with Kelly Lindsay earlier today. Um, she's a coach, national team coach. Um, she was the national team coach of the Afghan women's national team. Now she's the uh, director of, of uh, soccer at uh, the Moroccan Federation. She said, we have to talk about it. She said, when I was learning, you know, going through coaching school, when I was getting my education to make coaching a profession, we never talked about this. And worse, certain behaviors that are not okay were normalized as being okay. There should be, there are, there are a lot of issues that are quite frankly, black and white, right? If you're in the workplace, if I'm back in a, you know, in corporate America, and I want to have a, a sexual relationship with somebody that reports to me, or I report to them, that everybody understands you don't do that. But for some reason in sport, there was this, there's this gray area, right? It should be very black and white. Somebody's leaving. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, there, there are, it's never okay. Um, so in other areas, there might be shades of gray, but let's clarify those. Let's talk about those. Um, and so talking about it is fundamental. And what are your major concerns right now in terms of women's access to sports in countries such as Saudi and Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you've mentioned? You know, I used to think that access alone was key, right? It's, it's about the access. Now, maybe it's just my age. Maybe it's just the experiences of what I've seen and heard. It, it's not enough. You can't just say we're going to have, we're going to fund women's football at this federation, this country, it's we're going to fund women's football and we're going to put in place safeguards to ensure that women's, that female players and the female officials, referees in football in particular, are it, even more at risk if it's possible to even imagine that. They're more at risk than um, players because they don't have collective voice. They don't have a team. They're individuals and they're highly, highly vulnerable to people who have 100% control over their career and their their opportunities to advance. And, and we've already seen reports in The Guardian in Haiti of horrific cases 
um, where people have been asked to do things that are not okay in order to advance or get assignments or what have you. Um, so these things, you know, are clearly uh, areas that, that have to be addressed. And we hear the term sports washing, don't we, where high profile sports events are brought to locations to almost distract potentially from a, a country's leadership or policy. How do you personally reconcile major events being hosted in countries, Saudi, China, Qatar, when they have poor human rights records on LGBTQ or women's rights? Do you think sport can be a, a catalyst for improving those human rights by going to those places? Is that your belief? So that's another good question. Um, there's a couple different, so that, that's a lot, right? That's, <laughs> Sorry. That's, that's a lot I'm, I'm of conscious of time and I've, I haven't got you for that long and I've got lots to ask you. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so I'll, I'll try to unpack that. There's a couple different ways. It's not necessarily about where you are. It's where you finish, right? So where you are when you're awarded an event, if you're awarded the event with a clear expectation that here are the human rights expectations that are in the bid, the bidding requirements, where we're going to ask you, can you acknowledge what your risks are and what you're prepared to do about them if you're awarded this event, right? That's where we want to be. And that's what happened with a 2026 FIFA World Cup bidding process is for the first time, they were asking bidding countries to say, what are the risks if you are awarded this event? What are your human rights risks that are present right now in laws, in practice, in whatever, and, and for everything, for LGBT, for women, for kids, for journalists, for, you know, people who live in the communities to, I mean, all of it. Uh, what are the risks? Acknowledge those. Do you, do you get what those risks are? So do you get it? And then secondly, what are you prepared to do about it? And so under those circumstances, where then they say, here's what we're prepared to do about it. And it's not a box ticking exercise. And there is real commitment. Then there's real opportunity right? That, that's enormous opportunity. But that's, that's the prisoner of hope side of it. But, but that only is effective if you have international governing bodies that put those sorts of requirements in the bidding requirements, right? So there's leverage and also that they're prepared to use it. So when things aren't as what was promised, what then happens? But look at Qatar. Look at what's happening in Qatar. There's an ILO office in Qatar, International Labor Organization, you know, it's a country that doesn't allow unions, and yet they now have a minimum wage law. They have elected representatives that represent workers to management. Um, they have a lot of things. There's still a lot to do, but that's big progress in a country that you know has had the World Cup and was awarded the World Cup 10 years ago. So it's extraordinary what's possible, um, but it takes real commitment. And looking more positively at the huge positives of sport, especially for, for women and girls, so why do you feel, we've, that you mentioned about in terms of the extraordinary athlete activists we've seen this summer and thinking in terms of the WNBA and Naomi Osaka and Megan Rapino and the like, why do you feel it's, it's female athletes that have been so vocal and, and powerful? <laughs> because we've had it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, I also see, though, that this is a bit of a unifier for men's and women's sports, right? The WNBA and the NBA, there's a lot of solidarity there, right? So it, it's interesting. It's, it's really cutting across. It's not us versus them. It's very much, yeah. this is all of our problem. You know, I don't know if it's cultural or it's, as women, we just, we just, or maybe we just, you know, got to a point where we say, you know, we have to, we have an opportunity to say some things finally because there's an opportunity that people are now listening. Uh, we have a few things to say. Um, and maybe it's pent up. Maybe, maybe it is. We've just had it. And we hear so much debate, don't we, about sport and, and politics. So do you feel that athletes should have the right to make political statements, social statements at major events such as the Olympic Games? Freedom of expression is protected human right. <laughs> All right. So if we're talking about limiting anyone's freedom of expression, being an athlete or anybody else, there should be good reasons for it. Public safety is one, right? You can yell fire in a movie theater. So saying something incredibly provocative and incendiary in a stadium full of people, not okay, right? I mean, so there are reasons why you would do that. Political statements also could be potentially highly inflammatory. 
But issues where you're talking about advocating for the human rights of others in a fundamentally a peaceful way, I don't know how you limit that if you're not disparaging someone else. I mean, I can see as an athlete myself, I've been on a podium. I've had my Olympic moment. I wouldn't want another athlete disparaging me or my country while I'm having my Olympic moment. So I get that bit of it, right? Not shaking someone's hand because you know they're from a country or, or what have you. That I get. But if you're peacefully advocating for the human rights of others, and it doesn't fall afoul of those things, um, I have a hard time understanding how you justify limiting that. I mean, in talking to FIFA, for example, um, they have to make decisions about, for example, at the World Cup, what banners do you let into the stadium? They're having to make those judgment calls on what you say yes to and what you say no to, and on what grounds. On what grounds is freedom of expression being limited? And they have a rubric for that. We're now getting into the grounds of now we're getting closer and closer to the field. (laughs) Now we're on the field. (laughs) Now we're on the podium. Now we're at the award ceremony. Um, We're not in the mix zone. It's it's right out there. And it's sort of that last barrier. And uh, I think people are struggling with it. But I think, you know, athletes are not going to stop speaking out. So it's here and it's probably here to stay. So I think finding a way to accommodate it in a way that's safe and respects the, the sporting, you know, sporting sort of principles that we have about competing, I think is important. Excellent. And just finally, we've obviously seen incredible growth in women's football in the, in the past decade. So how do you feel we could make sure that is maintained post COVID as we come out of that? But, but what would be your, your hopes and plans for that? I think first and foremost, I mean, particularly with COVID, I mean, it's hit, I mean, it's just been an absolute gut punch to a sport. Contemplating that economic impact is, it's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around and it's going to be here for years to come, right? The impact of this. I think what's important first and foremost is to safeguard the tremendous gains that we've made in women's sport and making sure we don't go backwards. So, you know, I we were out early. We also said in the APPG, all party parliamentary group, which we we convened a call uh, with the APPG on this, is you know the impact of COVID and what's important uh, right now. And we've said that any public money that is used to bail out professional sport needs to protect women and women's sport and sport for persons with disabilities. You don't get a cut wheelchair at the U.S. Open, right? Please, you know, let's just talk about those decisions that are being made. Um, to make sure people don't get left behind. So I think with COVID, it's you want to have the growth continue, but also because of the existential threat, let's make sure that we're not going backwards. Um, and it's important to safeguard that, particularly when public funds are being used to assist different sectors. Thanks again to Mary for taking the time to talk to me. It was fascinating to learn more about her work at the Centre for Sport and Human Rights. If you'd like to hear more, do listen to their podcast. It's called Sport and Rights, and it's available on their website or on all the usual platforms. Thanks again to Barclays for their kind support of the Game Changers, and also to Sam Walker from What Goes On Media, who does a fantastic job as the executive producer for the podcast. You can find out more about all 49 of my guests from this and previous series at fearlesswomen.co.uk. Previous trailblazing guests working to change the face of women's football include the likes of Sue Campbell, Moya Dodd, Ebru Coxal and Kelly Simmons. It's always lovely to hear that people are enjoying the stories of these game-changing women in sport. If you have a moment, please do give the podcast a rating or a review. That would be brilliant. You can get in touch on social media where you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at Sue Anstis or at The Game Changers. Next week, I have the absolute privilege of talking to a real trailblazer in football. It's professional match official, Sean Massiellis. I definitely get nervous, but I'm a bit of a stickler for doing things in a routine. So, you know, I'll eat the same things before a game. I'll get up at, you know, certain times. I'll eat certain times before games. You know, I'll pack my kit in a certain way. I'll put my kit on in a certain way. I'm like a 
a real stickler for like sticking to routine. I always think that's because we talk about what we can control. So for me, I can control all of that. I can control my fitness. I can control that my kit's in my bag at the right time. I can control that I leave the ground on time. You know, all them kinds of things. And I think that that routine always helps me deal with my nerves, I think. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.